Okay, whenever you two are ready, I think we'll give it a go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, a yeah. warm welcome to everyone um, who joined our digital coffee break today. Um, my name is Angela and I'm responsible for marketing here at AppWorks. And um, just a quick introduction on AppWorks for those of you who don't know AppWorks yet. Um, we are a 100% subsidiary of Premium Aerotech and part of Airbus. We design, develop and manufacture products that truly exploit the benefits of additive manufacturing. And before handing over to our speakers of today, um, some technical remarks. Um, you can see below your screen a Q&A session. So whenever during um, the presentation, some questions arise, um, just type them in and after the presentation we will go through the questions and answer them live. Um, yeah, our speakers of today are um, Maximilian, who um, was leading the project of the Bugatti exhaust, as well as Basti, who is leading the whole project engineering or production engineering team here at AppWorks. Yeah, so I would say it's time for you to grab your coffee, which is required item and essential of today. Lean back and listen to Maximilian and Sebastian and um, yeah, ask questions whenever they arise. Okay, so thanks Angela and also a very warm welcome from my side. Um, yeah, as mentioned by Angela, my name is Sebastian. I am heading the application and project engineers at AppWorks. And as such, I'm yeah, very happy to present yeah, some of the most interesting facts and yeah, probably also challenges we faced during the last months to you. Today, uh, virtually sitting next to me, our project leader, Maxi. And if I'm honest, it's not really virtually as he's sitting in the next uh, just like two or three meters in front of me. Um, but in times of Corona, you might all know that we need to keep distance. So yeah, Maxi, please feel free to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Basti. Uh, so also from my side, a uh, warm welcome. As Basti already said, um, I am in the project lead for this um, project for Bugatti. It is a 3D printed exhaust system that I will uh, show you in detail from now. Okay. Um, just to start right off from the first slide, uh, what we actually are doing here, we are producing a 3D printed exhaust from titanium, which is a high performance material in additive manufacturing. Uh, compared to the previous parts that Bugatti was producing on their Shiro, we uh, were able to uh, generate a 39% weight reduction on this. The purpose of the part is uh, mainly to streamline the exhaust flow and to support the rear downforce, which is um, not too low for cars of this speed, actually. So the part um, has a lot of technical and optical details that we... Um... Angela, can you do the next slide? <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, for you to actually see where the part is located on um, the car, you can see uh, the marketing video that Bugatti published. And I see you already can see where the part sits. <clears throat> okay. 
Nice car. I would uh, totally take a ride on this one. So uh, let's take a look at the technical details. Why did we use additive manufacturing and not something else? Basically with this part, we're exploiting all the benefits of additive manufacturing. We designed a very lightweight optimized geometry with this part that would not be possible with any conventional um, manufacturing methods. We're using the freedom of design that we're basically having by the layer based manufacturing. We also have functional styling. So some um, features of the parts that you will see do not only look nice, they also have some uh, technical features that provides a lot of advantages to us. For example, an optimized flow direction that we can achieve with the inner shape of the parts. Speaking of the design, we uh, really deep dived into application engineering for this part. So for example, we do achieve wall thickness of uh, less than 0.5 millimeters for those who are experienced in the um, laser-based additive manufacturing processes will know that this is a pretty uh, low thickness and we were uh, able to achieve that throughout the whole part. To actually achieve that we were using a lot of parameter optimization for the part and the support. Especially for the support we developed an own strategy to ensure safe build conditions so that we um, get safe build conditions that we actually build fast and reduce the post-processing time. So as you maybe know, a lot of parts need a lot of manual uh, post-processing steps and we try to re uh, reduce that by our support strategy. Also, we are minimizing material consumption by this and we try to reach an optimum of dimensional tolerances throughout the whole height of the part. Talking of the functional styling that we uh, actually applied, we have two features that are very unique to this uh, part. First on the left side, you will see the lattice structure, which is between, um, two, between two of the very thin walls that I already talked about. Um, compared to the massive volume, the weight is actually reduced up to 70% with this feature. And uh, the purpose is actually to connect the two thin walls and build a strong connection between them. And by that, we also can reach a high geometry uh, accuracy of vertical walls. For those who know, um, vertical walls in this uh, manufacturing process tend to get distorted as higher as they get. And with this lattice, we can basically get a strong connection between them and um, let's say keep them together. On the right side, you see a honeycomb pattern um, applied to the surface. Uh, it is the same reason actually, because if you let uh, that surface grow in a bigger height, you can uh, reinforce uh, thin walls and uh, get more stiffness within the walls and therefore you can prevent the geometrical deviations as well. Talking about the material and the process, we are using um, titanium as a material, which is pretty uh, wide used as a material for that additive manufacturing process. It is lightweight, but still has very good mechanical properties, which you can uh, see on the left side, which is uh, the reason why that is often used in many different industries as for example, automotive or aerospace or medical um, industries. Uh, the part is actually produced on an EOS M404, the Quattro system, which is an ultra-fast quad laser system um, from our friends in uh, Kreiling. Um, with this, we can produce thin walls and complex shapes. Um, those can be adapted to other applications. So heat exchangers and all the thermal management systems are pretty uh, interesting for these also. And speaking of the material, um, alternatives. Some parts of these industries and also heat loaded parts are also built with um, nickel alloys. That really depends on your requirements to heat resistance uh, and mechanical properties to choose which material you actually want to take in the end. So if we take a look at the additive manufacturing process flow in total, there's actually a lot of steps that we have to fulfill before we can get um, the finished part. 
first we dive into application engineering with uh, which consists basically of the design of the parts then we need to check how we can actually orient the parts in uh, the build in the build volume then we need to design all the supports uh, speaking of the support strategy that i told you before we need to develop uh, parameters for the part and for the support structures and we need to do the machine preparation basically everything from your idea to bringing the part on the machine the next step will already be the build job so that means really printing the part next up is the heat treatment so um, as you maybe know titanium is very stress loaded material more than other materials might be that means we need for sure a heat treatment which is at 720 degrees for this project and this uh, still happens on the build platform which brings us to the next step which is the wire edm this is a contour based uh, clean wire cut which is basically removing the part from the build platform next step is a manual support removal so that means the part will go into our production hall and uh, the workshop where our um, employees there will actually remove all the supports from the build part to um, ensure the shape that we actually wanted in the ideal phase next step is a coating since the part is highly loaded with temperature we um, need a coating that will withstand these temperature loads it is a ceramic based black coating so it is both a technical requirement and also optical um, since it will be visible in the back of the car last step and actually um, fitting into every step of the production is the quality assurance we obviously need to ensure highest quality since this part will go on the streets um, this consists of dimensional checks so that means we have to fulfill all the dimensional requirements and also surface testing so that basically means we for sure have to prove that the car uh, that the that the part on the car will withstand the temperature load that it will be um, applied to in reality okay that was basically all from um, my side and i'm happy to hand over to basti Okay, thanks Maxi for those insights. Um, I guess this was a really nice overview of our, let's say, technical deta deta uh, details and challenges we faced, I would say, during the last month. So it definitely took, took a while to, uh, to be at the status we are now. And as already mentioned, uh, we are going into serial production with the Bugatti exhaust. And therefore, I would like to yeah, somehow highlight the main differences um, in general, but also based on on two, um, yeah, two projects itself um, between prototyping and serial production or small serial production, of course, always in terms of additive manufacturing. So still not talking about the millions of parts, I guess you're all aware of this. Um, I mean, even if honestly, the whole AM market is talking about, uh, we need to go into serial production and how to go into serial production with the different kind of parts, and you might definitely agree that there are still many reasons, um, applications and even market itself um, for those uh, prototyping with additive manufacturing can still lead to, to a high added value. Uh, for example, short lead time during the product development or reduced costs for, for low quantities and, and so on. I guess that's, that's quite clear. And therefore, I would like to start with, um, let's, so, uh, let's say, explaining the, the APREX approach on how to deal with prototyping projects um, versus serial production projects and what are their main differences. So on the one hand, you can see on the left upper area, the prototyping um, site. Um, and this approach is called built to print. Um, I mean, that's not an official naming for it or wording for it. It's basically our APREX approach. Um, mostly used for prototyping smaller quantities, but also for recurring orders. Um, so mainly plug and play orders. So whenever we have customers that order every two or three months, the same parts, um, this is somehow also covered by, by build to print. What does this mean? Um, normally for prototyping projects, the lead time requirements are really, really strict. So we're talking about order entry and we need to deliver within one week or two weeks a specific amount of parts um, and that's why it's quite clear in the end that there is mostly no no yeah 
not a lot of time for, for doing a huge redesigns or, or a complete redesigns. So quite often we really need to use or use the input design of the customers um, for, yeah, for engineering a quick production, uh, post-processing and so on. Um, of course, sometimes uh, smaller redesigns are unnecessary and still can be done. Um, as, but as long as the part is feasible to produce with additive manufacturing, um, in the end, there are uh, for specific markets and applications still a lot of advantages by yeah, just printing uh, the parts. Um, as the focus is, is most of the time on, on shortest lead times. On the other hand, and that's below on the slide, there is our design and build approach, which is uh, most of the time used for higher quantities uh, or long-term projects. Um, so either we use the input design from the customer that is in the end, um, let's say fully redesigned by AppWorks for additive manufacturing, or we sometimes also just have like specifications and boundary conditions, technical drawings and so on uh, to come up with a design that finally fits for AM. Um, so that's always depending on the on the project itself. And um, of course, if there is nearly nothing, so we need to design from the scratch. And um, we're not always talking about a, a huge amount of parts, but let's say mostly for the design and build project, the forecast is somehow based on on higher quantities. And of course, as we're doing those let's say redesign stuff, uh, simulation driven design, uh, several iterations sometimes, and there is always a, yeah a need of specific amount of parts to simply cover those, those pre-processing efforts, those, um, those costs, of course, for doing the redesign and the simulations. Um, but that's always depending in the end um, on the size of the part. Of course, if we're talking about small parts as a, I don't know, as a screw, and even for additive manufacturing, you cannot consider 100 parts as a serial production. On the other hand, um, 100 huge exhaust finishers um, that uh, yeah, need to be built one by one with all those requirements can probably be considered as a, as a small serial production. So now let's switch over to the next slide topic, post-processing, which is, uh, I mean, you know, we are all uh, aware of it, especially on the metal side, a very important um, topic um, and somehow related to the factors that um, I mentioned before, so the quantities and lead time. Um, as we are normally having kind of small quantities in a small, uh, short lead time on the prototyping side, um, it's quite similar as for the design. There is sometimes not that much time to perform, let's say, uh, 15 types of, of post-processing steps. Um, uh, but anyhow, we, we definitely understood and realized within the last, let's say, yeah, one or two years that the market is is not only um, aiming for, let's say, semi-finished parts anymore. So they really, the customer want to, want to receive final parts that can be assembled in their system um, and want to have, let's say, suppliers um, that can be used as a one-stop solution. And um, that's why we are um, currently already offering a huge range of post-processing steps besides the, the standard ones. So what do I mean with standard ones? That's probably clear to, to most of you. Um, doing the heat treatment, the support removal, probably some grinding operations and blasting. That was how additive manufacturing in, in the metal side um, yeah, um, was going on the last years. Um, but besides this, um, even for prototyping projects, we are um, more often doing machining operations, a different type of surface treatment, um, vibratory grindings, chemical treatments. Um, of course, also 3D surfing. Perhaps some of you have attended last week um, the presentation of my uh, dear colleague Maximilian Raab, um, or also doing anodizing, coating, and whatever. So in the end, regardless of the of the type of the project, whether it's a serial or a prototyping project, it's it's always the overall goal to satisfy the customer by by really trying to deliver final parts that can be directly used at the customer sites. Of course, for serial projects, as there is normally um, more time to plan, the requirements are definitely more strict. Um, there are sometimes more post-processing steps. It, honestly, it's not necessarily always um, more steps than for the prototyping, but of course, for serial projects, you always need to um, think of how to optimize those post-processing and how to minimize the risk during the manual support removal. This was especially one, one big topic during the, the prototyping phase uh, for, the, for the Bugatti Chiron. And all of those uh, post-processing steps are, of course, somehow depending on the requirements. And um, 
I, I won't go into, into the detail of all our, let's say, background activities that are based on the ISO 9100 certifications. Um, I mean, you're probably aware of it, that there is uh, a, lot of, a lot to do um, and a lot to ensure in the background. Um, let's say that the general standard quality assurances that are mostly used also for prototyping projects are um, kind of 3D scanning and sometimes CT scanning for, for, for inspection or for inspecting internal channels, for example. Of course, visual inspections, measurement protocols for, for machining operations, leak tests, tensile tests, and so on. Um, that's basically the standard. Um, but again, regardless of the, of the type of the project, it's always um, depending on the customer requirement and can always be extended, of course, um, based on, on the customer requirement. Um, but anyhow, as I said, for prototyping projects or these, um, as we call build to print projects, um, it's uh, mostly the case that there is not that much time to, for example, perform huge first article inspections or PPAPs for the automotive sector. And um, even for the Bugatti project, of course, the prototypes we delivered last year were in the end not used for, for mounting on the customer cars or that's quite obvious that the QA requirements are, are somehow lower than for the serial production. On the serial production, it's basically, um, yeah, especially in the, in the, during the qualification phase or period, it's definitely a huge effort. I mean, it's, uh, Maximilian is, is aware of it. He's, he's struggling since uh, probably beginning of this year with all these uh, qualification topics. It's definitely a huge challenge. Um, in the end, it's, uh, according to the standards of the automotive OEMs, in this case, it's, it's, it's Volkswagen, you always need to perform uh, and go through a sampling process. Um, and a sampling process yeah, needs to be done whenever a new part is produced or an existing one is changed. And uh, basically, that's a lot of uh, paperwork and, and going through all different kind of uh, QA requirements. But in the end, it's, it's just a confirmation of the supplier that all requirements according to the, to the technical specifications are fulfilled. And of course, not only for the qualification parts, but also for all upcoming parts, uh, even regarding dimensional tolerances. So, and as you have seen uh, the part itself, and Maxi mentioned some of the technical details, you can probably um, uh, yeah, understand the, the challenges we had, especially regarding dimensional tolerances as for thin wall parts like this, the building with additive manufacturing, um, the challenges regarding, let's say, distortions are really, really tough. And that's why I'm really proud that we are, uh, yeah, nearly before starting the, the serial production now within the next weeks. Um, yeah, and during the serial produ production, it's simply the case that, of course, we always need to prove the technical requirements um, for each job, um, always based on, on the technical drawings, on a specific failure catalog, um, especially for post-processing. And surely there, is a, there needs to be a, a huge risk manage, management uh, specifically for this project in the background. So now let's talk about the money, which is uh, probably yeah, quite interesting for, for most of you, and the differences in price per part. Um, I mean, of course, I cannot give you the, the real uh, figures, um, what uh, these, these Bugatti exhaust cost, but I, I would like to emphasize that the costs per part are normally really highly reduced for higher quantities. Um, so compared uh, prototyping versus serial production, and that's basically caused by, let's say, all the non-recurring efforts you need to have during the prototyping phase. So um, let's say the, all the development efforts for parameter development, um, support development, doing all the design stuff, um, which definitely took some, some weeks and months in the last year. Um, if you have machining operations included, the, the programming uh, or the tooling or whatever. Um, and even in this case, um, as we are only, even though we are only possible to, let's say, to fit one, one part on the build platform, in even this case, um, let's say we're always talking about or sometimes talking about 50% or even more reduction um, compared to, to prototyping. And to finish this slide, uh, two examples. I mean, we talked about a lot about the, the Bugatti Giron Pure Sport, which is more on the serial production perspective. But we also uh, were ha really happy to build the first prototypes of the Bugatti um, Giron Supersport last year. 
Um, you might have seen it on the form next as well. Um, those um, yeah, exhaust finishers were directly mounted on the part, uh, on the car. Uh, I guess it, it definitely could be considered as a one-stop solution. Uh, I guess we had like two weeks and we directly shipped the part to the, to the racetrack. So it was kind of challenging. Uh, but in the end, this car broke the world record with uh, 300 miles per hour with our exhaust uh, printed at Epic. So yeah, definitely kind of proud. Okay, so that's basically it to the comparison. Um, here you can see again uh, a nice picture of the um, of the exhaust mounted on the Chiron Pure Sport. I hope the last minutes gave you a nice overview of the current projects, uh, of the challenges we definitely faced during the last month, of our USPs for the exhaust and why we use additive manufacturing, and of course why Bugatti perhaps decided to go with Airworks. Um, we talked about the design freedom, how to implement those, uh, well, this freedom in a suitable design for AM. Uh, Maxi explained the weight saving and on all the, let's say, the impact of the weight saving on the steering behavior, uh, possible advantages of using Tie 64 with AM, but also that it's always depending on the customer and, and similar projects are running on, on uh, nickel alloys and so on and so on. So a lot of technical details and we might be able to answer some of those um, afterwards. Um, but as you can see on the picture, um, have a fine look on the exhausts mounted on the, par on the car. In my opinion, it's really stunning. Um, and to finish the presentation, I would like to, to quote the founder of Bugatti, Mr. Ettore Bugatti, who once said, an automobile component must be technically perfect, but it must be elegant and beautiful too. So I guess we definitely achieved both requirements, um, not only the technical ones, but also the, the aesthetic ones quite well. That's it. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. So feel free to use the Q&A field. Um, and then let's start with all the open questions. Thanks. Okay, then let's start. So first question um, by Paul O. Um, what is the absolute weight of the part? Maxi, I guess you are, you can give mm -hmm. a, an answer also of the, let's say the, the full assembly. Uh, yeah, sure. The full assembly. So um, there's some additional parts um, assembled to the, to the exhaust finisher. <clears throat> um, and in total, we are roughly below two kilograms. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I would also take the next question that I see here from uh, Peter Rogers. Hi, mate. Uh, considering the incredibly thin walls, well done. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> what were some of the unique support techniques used in this part? Um, good question. So that basically can be spread on two sides. One is the geometrical side of the support. So how you do design the support structures. And the other one is which parameters do you use? So basically you have to find a good combination between um, how the supports look and how they are bound to the part or maybe even not bound and, and just support the structure and the uh, um, power that you actually apply to these uh, support structures. Okay, the next question. Um... Michael Sattler asks, how many uh, parts do we fit on a platform? I guess we already somehow answered this. Um, so as we're using the M404 with the uh, built volume of 400, 400 times approximately 370, the EOS guys might know this, uh, this little issue in the marketing. Um, we're only fitting one part per platform, but um, to be honest, that's, uh, that's totally fine for us as um, the whole job takes about 24 hours. So and even from a, let's say, production planning perspective, that's, that's really perfect for us because we can really, uh, yeah, build like five parts per week without the re uh, weekend. So that's quite nice. Okay. Um, one question from Steven. How did you design the honeycomb pattern on the part? Uh, that is actually a software thing. So you basically take the surface that you want to apply the honeycomb pattern on, you extract this surface and with uh, generative design softwares, you then apply this 
pattern to the surface and then uh, going back to design you will uh, combine the initial parts with this new surface and if you merge those two you will get a part with the honeycomb structure on it okay thanks maxi uh, what's next um, again michael sattler um, how long does it take to let's say uh, remove all the powder which is inside uh, let's say or between those those walls before doing the heat treatment? Uh, very good question. Um, fortunately, it is very easy as um, we, let's say we performed a lot of tests, um, especially regarding the, uh, the lattice structure, um, regarding the thickness of the structure and also of the size of the, of the lattice itself. So it probably takes around 10 minutes and the part is completely free of powder. So, um, but it was somehow a, a question uh, or a problem we we needed to to solve when we began to to first uh, print the or print the first parts, uh, but so far it's no problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I uh, check the time, I would say last um, question from my side. I see. Uh, can you maybe talk about possible failures of the exhaust finisher? What is the most likely failure case? Um, to be honest, the biggest challenge was the thin walls. Uh, firstly, uh, below 0.5 millimeters is very thin and um, with all the stress factors that you have in the titanium uh, combined, combined with the uh, additive manufacturing process, you will have uh, distortions in thin walls over a great height. So that is the most likely failure case. And um, we had quite some trials to get rid of that with different support and parameter strategies, but I would say to answer your question that the thin walls are the, the dimensional tolerance of the thin walls is the most likely failure case. Perhaps one last question, Angela, if I'm, if you still give yeah. us one or two minutes, <laughs> uh, which is kind of interesting um, by Stefano Scaramuzza. I hope I that's right. Um, did you carry out tests with prototype parts during the development or was almost everything developed on FEM? Yes, we, we definitely built prototypes. Um, there was yeah, someone last year. Um, of course, they were used um, on an on a iteration-based uh, base. So um, we, we always tried and definitely also did it to improve um, all, let's say, the open issues we had. And, but we already yeah, finished this prototype fast successfully. And yeah, I guess for parts like this, um, honestly, it is definitely necessary to, to build parts, um, build, build physical parts because it's simply too challenging, um, especially due to uh, thin walls. Okay, so I'm playing the bad guy. You will <laughs> just get uh, one minute. Oh, so Maxi, choose so wisely. Oh, so one more question. Um, okay, what do we have here that is answered? Perhaps by uh, Wolfgang Käfer, what is the planned number of parts oh, yeah. over lifetime? Um, yeah, good questions as well. So far, it's not uh, yeah, finally clear. It's of course always demanding or based on the customer requirement or the end customer demand, but it's approximately 100 parts um, over the lifetime. Um, could be more, could be some some less, but approximately 100. <clears throat> we could do more, that would be okay for us. <laughs> Good. Yeah, then I think we unfortunately time-wise need to take those questions with us and answer them afterwards, not to bother too much of your time. Um, yeah, so thanks you too. And uh, a special thank you to all the attendees and all the uh, questions which arose. Um, really interesting to see that it um, caused so much interest and um, that, um, yeah, a lot of people congratulated us to this really amazing project. Yeah, so thanks to everyone and um, we hope that we see us again this time in two weeks as in Germany, luckily, this May of all bank holidays is appearing. 
So <laughs> next week there is bank holiday. So the next coffee break is in two weeks from now. Um, and we are having a topic on um, quality and quality assurance next time. Yeah, so thanks from my side. Have a good afternoon and um, talk to you soon.